Coming up on Theatre Talk. The biggest part of our company, really, has been this emerging force of Hillary because she wasn't <laughs> as, as uh, she was there at the beginning, mm. but it, what, she's now there every day and, and <laughs> helping us with rewrites and spotting things all, all the time. I mean, it's as though she's on stage with us. I usually hang out with a crowd of dead people. <laughs> <laughs> We're not there yet. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theatre Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Wolf Hall is the name of Dame Hilary Mantel's award-winning novel on the life and career of Thomas Cromwell, the ambitious secretary of Henry VIII. It is now also two gripping plays at the Winter Garden Theatre on Broadway. We are pleased to be joined by the actors Ben Miles, who plays Thomas Cromwell. Boo, the villain! Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the <laughs> oh, <laughs> And Nathaniel Parker, who plays the highly maladjusted Henry the A. <laughs> highly high adjusted, I think. Is what we also welcome the, the production director Jeremy Heron. And, and the woman who began it all, <laughs> Hilary Mantel, who is the author, of course, of the runaway bestseller book, Wolf Hall, winner of the Man Booker Prize. And one of, bring one of up the, the body. Of time. Because the Wolf Hall two evenings are both Wolf Hall and bring up the bodies. And you're at work on the third, right? I am, yes. And how is, how is that going? It's going with great energy, speed. I'm more fascinated by the whole project, the whole subject, than when I began. And the production is actually a great help. Yeah. It, it's unique because normally when there's an adaptation, the primary work's finished, the right. book's closed. Right. In this case, the book's still in progress. Mm -hmm. It is in some ways feeding what happens in the shows. The shows are feeding what happens in the book. It's a marvellous way to work and I think quite unique. Did you have any sense when you, because I, I know you've written several novels before this, did you have any sense it could be a play or did you ever, ever have any desire to write a play or to be in the theatre? I've written radio drama mm. and I love the theatre, mm -hmm. but the opportunity had never come along. But I do, I do see, see everything as I write, I hear everything as I write. Mm -hmm. So in my imagination it's not a big jump, <laughs> technically of course bringing the project to the stage is quite a difficult thing to do. It's highly complex, something like 159 characters in the books. <laughs> yes, a little, cut, little cutting had to be done there, Jeremy, for the, uh, for the, for the, for the stage play. Yeah, 22 right. hard-working actors <laughs> and some wigs. You're working with the adapter. Nick. That's right. Mike Poulton. Mike. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So how did this uh, project come come together? Was this something that you were interested in in the beginning? Well, I, I mean, I read the book when it, when it first came out and, um, and loved it and read it sort of obsessively and didn't for one second think that it would ever exist on stage. Really? I never thought about that in any way. But when I got the call from Playful, Matt by I'm sure, the producer, mm -hmm. to say that Mike and Hillary had been working on adaptations and would I be interested in talking about it, it just struck me as the most perfect idea. Partly because it was so challenging and intimidating. As Hillary says, so many characters and there's such a sort of interiority in Cromwell's, you know, the, the, the books are, are written from his point of view. Mm -hmm. So it, feel, it felt like that, that was our first big moment, was to work out how to translate the specificity of his world onto the stage right. um, without doing it from behind his eyes. So that was the challenge, really. Um, and I suppose like lots of good projects, the, the ones that seem impossible are often the ones that are most enjoyable. We should say that here in New York, um, the, the, the buzz about this production is akin to the uh, excitement generated by Nicholas Nickleby uh, many years ago that the RSC did, I guess, in 1980 or 81, introduced Trevor Nunn to us all, and that was a, a two-part, eight-hour extravaganza, too, that, much like Wolf Hall, 
is uh, uh, captures the public's fancy. Well, it's, it's selling extremely well, and it's thrilling. I, I've seen. I was at the first preview, and it is thrilling. Now, uh, Nathaniel Parker plays Henry VIII. When he comes in for an audition, is it just that voice? You say that's it. He doesn't have anything else. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't heard you speak I yet. Wish things were that was, easy. <laughs> it was. It was the axe that really. <laughs> 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 the trail of wives. <laughs> yeah, it's the trail of wives. The Hari. <laughs> what I what did you me. audition with to audition for Henry VIII? What was your What was your uh, your piece? Um, <laughs> he's, but, uh, and that is beyond that stage of having to do a piece for. Oh, offer for only. A <laughs> yeah. Offer only. Yeah. Well, he say. did. He did come in and meet for it, and he was he was uh, he was utterly impressive. I did, um, a, I did a rather naughty thing, to be honest, which was that, um, and I wasn't in a great mood that day, uh, but I'd read it and. Uh, Having, to, having said no to it a couple of times, because oh. I was doing the audience in London at the right, time, right, right. and with Matt by, I'm sure, again, playful, um, being for the producers, and I just didn't want to do any more theatre. It takes you out of home so much. Yeah. And so I said, no, I don't want to do And he came back and said, please, oh, no, I don't, no money in it, really. Um, so I went, no. And then they gave me the script. I went, mm, OK. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll have a look. I'll meet with Jeremy then. <laughs> and I met with Jeremy. And um, he said after it, OK, c can we just read a scene? And I went, no, I don't want to read a scene. That's the kind of mood I was in, right? So I don't yeah. want to be seen. Uh, he turned to the, um, to the cast and he said, I thought we'd agreed he would read a scene. I said, all right, I'll read a scene. And I'd learnt it. Uh, ah. <laughs> it was a bit naughty. Was it? Oh, it was, was that? No, I just thought, oh, God, what an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't actually think that. I thought much worse. <laughs> I won't say that. But actually, what was, what was brilliant, and it seems to kind of sum up, I mean, that, I think that was really clever because he just came in. He'd obviously committed to the project. And it's a difficult thing for an actor, isn't it, when you go and you have to read and you get judged on something that actually is the start of a kind of creative yeah. journey. But what yeah. was just amazing was that he just pulled the rug out from under us. And it was a kind of pitch perfect mm -hmm. production. It but came I still in came an away. I still yeah, came away, wonderful. actually, thinking, I'm, I, you know, there's still a, a slight doubt in my mind. And I was working with Penelope Wilton at the time on the radio. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. And she said, oh, I hear you're working with Jeremy. I don't know how she'd heard so quickly. Maybe you'd spoken to her or something. But uh, I said, mm, I said, no, no, you must. He's the best director around. And he is. I mean, I know he's here right now, and I'm hoping he doesn't give me notes on last night's show in front of the whole audience. But it was, he is the best I've ever worked with. How brilliant of you to be Henry VIII at your audition. Now, w w did you act Are you like offer only the divisive, <laughs> Did you act like the divisive, uh, the sneaky Thomas Cromwell at your audition? I didn't get an audition. I got a phone you call in my car. Right. Uh, out of the blue, saying uh, they wanted to pay Thomas Cromwell at the RSC in Wolf Hall. And, uh, I sort of dropped the phone and picked it up again and said, really, are you serious? And they said, yeah. So um, it was an entirely different process for me. And then Jeremy and I met and we had dinner at the, at the Globe Theatre on the South Bank in London. We talked about the project. We talked about, you know, approaches to work and stars of theatre and stuff we liked, stuff we didn't. And that was it, really. It was kind of sealed over yeah. a bottle of wine and a, yeah. and a steak, which is a, my kind of audition, really. <laughs> so I'm going to insist on doing that. Did you have on. casting approval, though, Hillary? Did you sit in when they ran these names by you? And no, no, I didn't. I, I wasn't really so involved with the, the project at that stage. I was very much at arm's length. I was working away with Mike Poulton, the adapter, mm -hmm. but very much in the back room at that stage. It's incredible the amount of work you do. I wanted to ask you, would you give a thumbnail of the personality of Thomas Cromwell, the central character? Would you, for those who, who don't know this, would, could you describe this man historically? Thomas Cromwell was a blacksmith's son. Yeah. He rose to be the king's right-hand man, his chief minister, a reshaper of the nation, he stayed at the top for almost 10 years, which was quite a feat in yeah. Henry's time. My question was, how did he do it? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you, in those times when society was very rigid, rise through the ranks so rapidly and with such impact? He was extremely clever. He was cool. He kept his nerve. He was a big picture man, which made him audacious, a visionary. And it's interesting you start the book by telling yes. us that he's an abused child. That's not so much in the plays, but that, you, that he's, a, that, that he's a, a blacksmith is beating him up all the time, and so he has this, this background that's... Yeah. You you better, that in, right? Yes. I yes. did, yeah. I mean, I, I remember very, very early on to, in sort of script uh, conversations mm. we had, I was, I, was, I was quite sort of insistent that that scene was in, that we, somehow we got to show the audience that. You know, we had ideas of like getting a young seven-year-old kid in and having <laughs> that scene, not, up, right. you know, but having that scene happen at the top mm -hmm. of the show. But uh, 
dramatizing your books was a process of kind of elimination of, mm -hmm. yeah. yes. of, They're of, so rich. of, of what has to, you know, we can't, we can't have the whole story in the plays. But funnily enough, we kind of have got the whole story in the plays. Oh, you don't need we it in the play. We allude to so many yeah. other things that aren't in the play. It um, seemed to be the biggest discussion <coughs> in the press in England before yeah. we opened mm. was, can this possibly be done? <laughs> yeah. yeah. it can't. And yeah. What, you mean a skeptical British press? <laughs> Never heard of that before. <laughs> well, we hit them between the eyes. I mean, from the word go, actually. I remember sitting at the table read when I hadn't yeah. met, I hadn't met any of the cast before. I didn't know any of them. And um, I just thought, oh, this is, this is a hit. We don't need to worry about West End. But this is where we need to focus is Broadway. Really? And I just, I've never uh, had that I wasn't before. thinking that. <laughs> I, I, I was thinking, how do we get the running time down? <laughs> <laughs> I've like never five had Five hours <laughs> to, to two and a half. <laughs> yeah. No, you I did. You always I, said New York will like Thomas Cromwell. Yeah, I had yeah. this idea early yeah. on that, that if, this, if this town existed, he would have come over here and just... <laughs> He'd have been mayor in a month as well. <laughs> that's right. It very, feels very contemporary. I mean, I think, yeah. you know, that, that's why I suppose this story has been reinterpreted over the years so, so successfully, is that in, some, in one way or another, it ends up talking to the culture that it, that it, that it is. And I think Hillary's genius has been to locate in Thomas a, a character that really speaks about where we are mm -hmm. culturally. He's not, he's anti-heroic in the yes. most yeah. engaging yes. and exciting way. And he's kind of unknowable, which is, which is brilliant for two, uh, two shows because the audience are constantly on the back foot, on the front foot, they think they've got him, he slips out of their grasp. He's always moving and always changing. And he's terrifying, but he's utterly charming as well. Yes. So it's a kind of, there's a sort of guilty pleasure in there as he's well. He's a sort of Tudor Tony Soprano, if you will. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, actually, yeah. you know, rather than any yeah, of the historical um, examples, like the Sopranos and yeah. Godfather and House of Cards, things like that were the, were the kind of great, um, the great influences for, for for us in terms of how do we make this character live? How do we how do we see him as a real person and not some kind of dusty historical right. artifact? Well, that's the genius of the book. I mean, all exactly. the characters. I was going to ask you about Henry VIII. How do you, I mean, Henry VIII, we all have the image, you know? Yes. The pictures, Charles Lawton. And how much does your costume weigh? Uh, well, it varies. I've got uh, <laughs> I've quite a few different costumes, but by the end of it, my last one, which yes. I have to race into in a matter of seconds, is about forty pounds. Okay. So. And uh, <laughs> so I'm going in and out of these things. There's a there's a very light one, which is easy to wear, <laughs> a, a nightgown. But otherwise, I'm in and out of armour and various costumes, and it's such fun. It doesn't give you a chance to breathe, really. Um, and he is a very different Henry. You're right. Normally, the Lord mm -hmm. and stuff of the chicken bone sucking, thigh slapping, yeah. wench grabbing Henry yes. isn't here. No. Uh, and one of Hillary. That's off stage. That's off stage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Barry. I was hoping you would. <laughs> um, but one of Hillary's genius um, moments in this, I think, is that uh, I remember on the, our second night in Stratford, a friend of mine brought his 13-year-old son, and I said to him afterwards in the dressing room, so did you understand it? Slightly nervous about his reaction. And he said, oh, absolutely, it's not Shakespeare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that is, for the, the, the dusty old historical yeah. thing, if, if anybody's out there thinking, oh, God, am I going to have to sit through Twinneth Twanneth? Yeah. rhyming couplets all evening? Yeah. No, you don't. Not in verse. It's absolutely. No. It's, not, it's not completely updated modern it's not completely no, modern. No. And, and with Henry I won't say um, didn't I'll say did not I, right. there's a certain right. amount of things which I will almost always try and uh, lift but it's um, it's absolutely vibrant and as as open as it possibly can be for today's audience right um, and Henry's just great everybody has a picture of Henry anyway uh, and they've all got this idea of him being so but I'm not playing that guy right. I'm playing Hillary's version of Cromwell's version of Henry right. so when Henry turns to him and says, tell me what to do, Thomas. Mm. It could actually have been just him going, so Thomas, what are we going to do? Mm. <laughs> but it's, it's Cromwell's yeah. version of this. This is what he said to me. He said, tell me what to do. Yeah. You know, and I said, through Hillary. So I'm having a ball, not playing the one that we all know. All the way out. Uh, you defeat the audience's <laughs> expectations the moment you walk on and open your mouth. That's the thing. So and that <laughs> is, you know, that surprise for the audience. Mm gives them some work to do, it pulls them into the play. Right. We're not telling them something they already know. Right, right. We're mm. asking them to use their imaginations mm. and... And you're going to meet, meet these people for the first time, in a way. Not the image you have of them from exactly. the history books. Yeah, yeah. No. exactly. That's, That's the great thing right. that this story's done, these books have done, that Hillary's done, is sort of re redefine these, these, these icons that we have, that we've had in our, in our consciousness. You know, Henry VIII, Anne Boleyn. Yeah. You've re, sort of reminted them for a whole new generation of people, of, of readers and theatre goers, and it's now you. This period is fascinating for the English, and I think for for people abroad as well. You know, it's 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 a very important 
stage in the history of England, the history of Europe and the history of the world. And for you to kind of, and for us to shed new light on these, these figures that we think we know, mm -hmm. I, it's I, very thrilling, it's very exciting, particularly for Thomas Cromwell, which is a character that not many people had Well, we'll know him from The Man of. for All Seasons, where he really is the villain, yeah. and Thomas, Thomas More is, yeah. the, is Paul Schofield, who's <laughs> totally pure and innocent, and of course you've flipped the perspectives on these. Yeah. Well, you know, in, in The Man for All Seasons, Thomas More is a 1960s liberal. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> You're precisely. The world has moved on a bit. <laughs> you know, he was a politician. It's yeah. hard to be a politician and a saint. Yeah. And I question the saint. You got rid of the saint part, that's right. Did you, um, were you a historian by training at all? No, no, I'm not. So where does this come from? You've, you know, you've written other novels and then all of a sudden you decide, I know a lot of this and I'm going to put it in, or did you have to spend years doing the research? Well, I, I've written a, a number of historical novels as well as contemporary novels. I love research. Um, I don't think of it as, you know, a phase you go through, there's the research, then there's the writing. Research is creative. Mm. And until you sit down to write a scene, you don't know what you need to know. Mm. So the process of research is continuous. What you're looking for is the tiny detail that lights up a page mm -hmm. or the word that lights up a character. Mm -hmm. And most of what you know is kept below the waterline. Mm -hmm. It's only the tip of the iceberg. Did you have access to a lot of materials and documents that most people can't get to see because they're so rare and valuable? I mean, do you have like a special key to the British <laughs> Museum? <laughs> Hillary Mantel room <laughs> where you get to look at boxes of things that no one else gets to look at? No, what I've got is the documents that are available to everybody and the Many of them you can see online. But I think the trick is um, to broaden out your research. You have to drill down into it like a historian would. But also you have to think about music, art, literature. What pictures would they have looked at? What books would they have read? That builds a world picture. Okay. So you come at it very narrowly and then you broaden the scope out. And it's a question of finding out where the facts ran out. And then on the basis of the facts you have, your best evidence that you can get, then you can start to imagine. That's you, where the novelist comes in. Exactly, yes. That's where you go to work when the historian stops. Uh -huh. Interesting. You recommend the book in many of your interviews about Thomas, about Woolsey. The, the, <gasps> yes. And, 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 which is readily available. The magnificent flamboyant Cardinal Woolsey, most powerful man in England, before Thomas Cromwell came along, was the king's advisor. Um, Woolsey had a, household, uh, a gentleman servant called George Cavendish, who was with him at some of the big events of his life and at his deathbed. George wrote a memoir. <laughs> he wrote it all down. <laughs> and it's marvellous. It's the first biography in English. Um, this book teaches you to talk Tudor. I owe everything to George Cavendish. <laughs> good, thing, good thing that book's not yes. copyrighted anymore. <laughs> it's in the public domain. <laughs> he wrote it like a novel, you see, because yeah, yeah. there was no template for doing this. Of course, yeah. yeah. So he will, he will do a scene for you, and then he'll say, no, let's leave that, and let's see how Thomas Cromwell has sped since we last <laughs> met him. I'm going to read this book. What's it called? It's called... The, it's called... called um, it's called The Life of Cardinal Woolsey. Um, the late Cardinal Woolsey. Now, Jeremy, as the director, you, do you do this kind of research that the, Hillary does? What's the point? We've got, <laughs> <laughs> we've got the phone yeah. We've got the phones of all wisdom. I mean, I, I used to joke in Stratford that Hillary could spot an inappropriate prop at 100 yards, you know. <laughs> just go, no, they wouldn't have that. So it's a fantastic resource to have for the, um, for the production. The biggest part of our company really has been this emerging force of Hillary because she wasn't as, as uh, she was there at the beginning mm. but is, what she's now there every day and and <laughs> helping us with rewrites and spotting things all all the time I mean it's as though she's on stage with us I usually hang out with the crowd of dead people <laughs> <laughs> we're not there yet yeah. Yeah. <laughs> give us a time give us a time <laughs> riddle that, that matinee audience on Sunday That's <laughs> how did you research your role I read Hillary's Just books. Yeah. That's it. That's yeah. all you need. They're, they're perfect you character do. studies for an yeah. act. You know, I, I, I need go 
no, nowhere else really. It, they were they are, they are fantastic source material. Still are. I'm still reading. I'm still talking talking to Hillary about it. Still emailing Hillary about it. Still trying to figure out why he does what he does. You know, th these are these are perfect books in terms of character analysis. They really are. But the questions Ben has asked me throughout the process have been feeding the third book. Ah yes. Yeah. Because I have to come up with answers. <laughs> and some of those answers, you know, there may be scenes in the third book that I wouldn't have done if right. Ben hadn't prompted them with a question or an image. Do you have a, uh, can you give us an example of something that he's brought up yeah. that got yeah. you thinking of Cromwell in a, in a different way? Cromwell ran away from home at the age of 15 after, as I describe it in my book, a very violent incident with his father, who was a drunk and a bully. We know this much about him. Why? What happened the night before the book starts? Um, I'd never... I'd asked myself that question. I hadn't come up, up with any answers. Ben said to me that he, um, in a certain scene in the play, he kept getting uh, an image of being under a bridge. And I said, no, you're not under a bridge, you're in a cellar. What arch you're looking at is uh, you're in an undercroft. It's the vaulting mm. above your head. Somehow I thought, I know that instantly, and I built the scene from there. So now we know what happens. The night before the first book starts, it will work around and come in as a flashback in the third book. I asked Hilary very early on that the, the, the play starts Cromwell returning from uh, an assignment in Yorkshire in the north of England that Walt has sent him on to try and get as much money as he can from the monasteries. I remember very early on in Stratford in rehearsals asking Hillary, emailing Hillary and saying, what do you think Cromwell might be thinking about on his journey down from Yorkshire to London, a sort of two-week mm -hmm. ride? Any thoughts? And back comes a kind of four-page email, which, which was like a chapter <laughs> from the book, telling me the number of horses he would have had to use, the weather on the way, the, the condition of the roads, the state of, uh, the, state of the English church, <laughs> who he might be writing to. And I'm reading this with my jaw on the floor. And, that, and that, from that first question has, has, has come this fantastic sort of correspondence, um, which has just given me so much... So have you had read the eight questions? Well, we started with um, a, a little printout for each of us. Of our yes, characters. they were great. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. I've never had before. I mean, I've been around for a long time now, <laughs> and I've never had that, and it was so helpful, wasn't it? I'm, I'm a slightly different uh, kind of actor. I, I approach it in a different way, which is I've got a script, and if, if I, if I um, transgress too far out of it, I try and put too much information, and then I, I implode uh, mentally. <laughs> so I, I'm much rather trying to do what's on the page and figure out how to say what's on the page and why it's there. Right. Um, I had a father who always used to say to me, I remember doing Vanity Fair, for God's sake, read the book, read the book, read the book. And I, I went halfway through it and went, just, just too much here. Yeah. I've, got to, I've got to come back and just do what the script says mm. and make it work within that environment. Mm. And that, that I really enjoy. Um, mm. That's my challenge. I mean, I've obviously I've read the books and adore the books, but that, if, I, if I kept going back to them, I'd be, I'd be going to Hillary, look, I really want that bit back in. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that, is, that is the danger. And in, in rehearsal, yeah. we had a moratorium on... Yeah. I, I would see a copy of the novel and I'd go, well, what's, what's going, going on? <laughs> Because there'd be someone who's, who's playing somebody just going, actually, there's this great bit. <laughs> <laughs> and it's full of great bits. And you really do yeah. have to. I remember doing um, Hamlet, well, those moons ago, with, with Zephyrilia. Laertes has an 80 line speech when he basically says to Ophelia, don't touch him at a barge pole when I go off to university. He's crackers. <laughs> Shakespeare put it better. And, <laughs> and it was reduced to two lines. Mm. And yes. I got to her and I went, you know what? I can't fight that. He's not going to give me an 80-line speech. <laughs> if, if, he, if he shot it, he'd just edit it or not turn the camera on. So you've got to do what's on the page. Mm. And I think that's really important. With something which is so full for this, I do Hillary's version of Cromwell's yeah. version of Henry. Because yeah. it, it was always really important for us. That, I mean, the novels are the novels. And, and if anyone out there ha you know, hasn't yet read them, they should read them because they're a fantastic, mm. magnificent achievement and a, and a wonderful experience. But our approach is different. We're making these stories, yeah. um, we're animating them for the stage. Right. So it's a, it's a different experience. It, and you can't uh, presume know. that everyone in the audience is going to have, have read the books. Well, and it, and it's got to be a theatrical think, experience, yeah, not yeah, just the novel absolutely. on the stage. And it's, and it's really important. And uh, as the director, it's always my job to just to try and put myself in, in a sort of state of innocence almost when I'm watching it and work out, OK, if I was coming to this for the first time with no information at all, what would I be picking up? All right. So just, mm. so to, just to make sure that, that as far as our audience is concerned, they don't need any prior knowledge. They don't need to have read the novels. They don't need to know anything about the history. It's all in there, presented in a really dramatic and exciting way. So that's our kind of... 
it's it's almost like they've been too too ambitious with it. On the on the one hand, to to satisfy someone who doesn't know anything about it, and on the other hand, to be so accurate and deft with it that it satisfies Hillary and her you know researcher historian friends and make sure that they don't have a problem with it as well. And if we can keep those two things in in balance, then it's a great achievement. Well, you I could mean, actually see part two without seeing part one and still have a blast. Yeah, it you happened, could. That happened last in night. England when they were called Wolf Hall and body, Bring Up the Bodies. Right. I had a lot of mates who, who couldn't get to see Wolf Hall, so they came yeah. to me Bring Up the Bodies, mm. and they loved it. And it wasn't it wasn't out of place at all. Yeah, it's like the great old um, uh, Ian Richardson House of Cards. Each the the three installments of House of Cards were. You don't have to. You can watch them independently. The one where he kills, he throws the king, and then. Thanks. Well, it would seem that you succeeded, since uh, the woman who wrote the book, Hillary Mantle, Wolf Hall, uh, approves of the stage, uh, stage adaptation in these. Uh, these, these clowns <laughs> <We're pretty laughs> <watching. laughs> these clowns running around with your wonderful characters. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, Wolf Hall at uh, the, uh, the Winter Garden. It is adapted from Hillary Mantle's best-selling book, Wolf Hall, and bringing up bodies. Bring up the, bring up the bodies. Bring up the bodies. And <laughs> we cannot wait for the third novel. <laughs> and I hope it's a play, too. Jeremy yeah. Heron, the director. Uh, Nathaniel Parker, Henry the Eighth, yes. Ben Miles, the... Um, Misunderstood, perhaps somewhat, Thomas. Thank Cuomo. you. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think we understand him far. <laughs> <laughs> and Hillary Mantle, thank you all for being our guest tonight on Theatre Talk. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Freeze the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, plus public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you, and good night.